Well, on behalf of Thompson Road Baptist Church, I want to wish you and your family a happy Easter for Resurrection Sunday. And just for this next short period of time, share with you the good news of Easter. Are you due for some good news? We've had plenty of bad news recently, haven't we? And it's all over the TV and social media, but we're due for some good news. And it was bad news to find out that we couldn't meet together to celebrate Easter Sunday this year, but good news that we have this online format so that we can celebrate the resurrected Christ together, though apart. We're so glad that you have joined us, and I want to just reassure you that uh, it's not our purpose to try to get your information, to get you to sign up for anything, uh, to get a financial gift or, or your membership or anything like that. In fact, many of you watching, we may never meet or even have a chance to find out that you watched the service today, but we've been praying that God would use this message as it goes out to have a spiritual impact on everyone who's able to tune in, and that maybe we would have some tune in for the first time today. Well, the good news of Easter centers, of course, on the life and work of Jesus Christ. History attests to the fact that Jesus of Nazareth really did live and minister in first century Palestine. He really was falsely accused, unjustly tried, brutally beaten, and hung on a cross to die. And people witnessed that event, and they spread the news of that event, and people tell about how it really did get dark in the middle of the day when Jesus breathed his last breath. There really was an earthquake. That thick temple curtain that separated the holy place, the symbol of God's earthly presence from the common people, really did tear in half from top to bottom when Jesus died that day. He really was laid in a tomb. And the Roman leader, Pontius Pilate, really did have the stone sealed with a Roman seal and guarded by Roman guards. Well, the rest, of course, is history. From that day on, people were talking about how that tomb was somehow empty. Others saying that they had seen and even spoken with a resurrected Jesus Christ. And so the news spread uh, from Jerusalem to the surrounding areas. And it wasn't long until Jesus' disciples, his closest followers, who did indeed see and interact with the resurrected Christ, would have an opportunity to meet with him and be sent out by Jesus before he went back up into heaven. He sent them out to tell everyone about the true meaning of his life, death, and resurrection and the impact that God intended and still intends for all of that. It's the central climax of all of history. All of the dates that we use today in modern reckoning, all the BC years leading up to the life and ministry of Christ, all of the AD years, and we're now up to 2020, uh, going from the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So as his disciples went and spread the news of his resurrection, their purpose was to help people to make sense of it all. And maybe you're watching today and you know about Easter each year, maybe you've celebrated in one way or another, but you've never really taken time to make sense of it all. Maybe you even know it's about Jesus and the resurrection, but what does it mean for you personally in your spiritual life and in your walk with God? Well, God sent the apostles out. Jesus sent his disciples out to tell people what it all was supposed to mean. See, he wasn't just an earthly teacher. He wasn't just a physical healer. He was one who came to live and die so that we might know forgiveness and have eternal life with him in heaven. And so that's the message that he sent the apostles out. And we'll look at a scripture passage from Acts chapter 13 together today. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter 13. And there in that passage, verse 4 says that it was the Holy Spirit that sent these men out. Here specifically, we read of Paul and Barnabas, devout followers of the Lord, who went out. This is their first missionary journey, just to go and tell people about the resurrected Christ and about what it was to mean for them spiritually in their personal spiritual lives. And so they preached, and they preached primarily to their own people, the Jews, and then that message began to spread to the Gentiles, especially as many Jews rejected it. But in Acts chapter 13, 
We read about the good news of Easter, and the message starts in verse 26. This is Paul's message to the people that had gathered to hear him today that needed the good news. He said, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Notice there in verse 26 that Paul says his message is, yes, it's primarily to the Jews, but it's for the Gentiles too, and it's specifically for those who fear God. That's the phrase he uses in verse 26, that the good news of Easter is really only going to be heard and received by those who fear God. Now, when we talk about fearing God, it's not the kind of fear that you might have uh, for harm from something who, that is evil or someone who has malicious intent. No, the biblical concept of the fear of the Lord is more of a healthy, reverential awe for something or someone that has great power. And so when we recognize the great power, the awesome grandeur of the God of the universe who created the universe, there ought to be a sense of fear, a healthy reverential awe for the one who deserves our respect and commands our respect. So someone who is a God-fearing person is just someone who believes that God is real and that what he says ought to be listened to that we ought to pay attention to what he said. Hopefully you're watching today because you have at least that level of fear of God where you say, yes, maybe God really is real, and maybe I ought to take just an hour on this Easter Sunday while we're under quarantine to think about what the good news of Easter might mean for me. So I hope you have that amount of respect for God so that you can listen to his word. And Paul says that this message that he has to share is the message of salvation. Well, that's good news. Salvation means being freed from, saved from, something that has us ensnared or entangled. Let me ask you, do you have something in your life that is keeping you down? An obstacle that is robbing you of joy? an internal struggle that is uh, keeping you from experiencing hope in life? Do you have a sense of darkness, a sense of emptiness, a sense of need, a void, something that's missing in your life, a greater meaning, a fuller purpose that you've never been able to fully uh, recognize and achieve? Well, if any of that describes you, or if it might describe you, you're in need of the salvation that Paul is talking about and that's recorded for us here in Scripture. So as I share this good news of Easter, I want to let you know, first of all, that the good news of Easter is inspired. It's inspired. That means that God sent this message for us to respond to. Notice that in verse 26. He says, uh, For whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Paul recognized he wasn't sharing his own message. This wasn't Paul's own idea. It was a message that was sent from God to those who would fear God enough to listen. And it's a message of salvation. It's an inspired message. This book really is God's word. It really is Holy Scripture. He inspired it, revealed it, and preserved it so that it could have a spiritual impact on us even today. And so if you fear the Lord enough to hear the message, to you, this message of salvation is sent. Verse 26, the good news of Easter is inspired because it's a message from God. But the good news of Easter is also unstoppable. It's unstoppable. And here's what I mean by that. Verse 27 uh, in the previous verses of the chapter, Paul has rehearsed for Israel their, their whole history, all the way back from the 450 approximately years of captivity in uh, slavery in Egypt to their deliverance from that and the leadership of the judges and then the prophet Samuel and then King Saul and then the mighty King David. And Paul here in the passage points out that it is through the lineage of the mighty King David that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, came. And so he picks up in verse 27 and says, They that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him 
In other words, Paul is saying that all of the prophecies about Jesus Christ, all of the prophecies about the Messiah, one who would come, suffer for his people, and die for his people, the people who rejected Jesus Christ, the Jews that had him executed, without even realizing it, were causing those prophecies to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Verse 28 says, And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they, Pilate, that he should be slain. They told Pilate, even though that there was nothing, no worthy cause of death in Jesus, they wanted him executed anyway. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, verse 29, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. Well, if God was going to work through something, someone, the world and the devil and fleshly people sure went to great lengths to stop God from working through that Messiah. Satan went to great lengths to stop the good news of Easter. And so people took Jesus, this good leader, the Son of God, in whom was no sin and no fault or error, and turned him over and falsely accused him and beat him and killed him and had him laid in a grave. It looked like the good news that Jesus was sent to bring had been stopped. Until we come to verse 30, where the Bible says, But God raised him from the dead. And that is how we know that the good news of Easter is unstoppable. Because even though people had rejected Jesus, even though they had killed Jesus and laid him in a tomb, God raised him from the dead. Yes, the good news of Easter is unstoppable. God created us to be good, to uh, be reflectors and magnifiers of his goodness. But each one of us, the Bible says, has gone astray. Each one of us has chosen sinful behavior, sinful thoughts, sinful words and actions. That each one of us, myself included, we have ugly thoughts. We've said ugly things and done ugly things. And so sin has corrupted our race through its influence. And if you're honest, it's easy just to look around in the world today and say, yeah, it's pretty clear and obvious that this isn't how it was meant to be. That sin has indeed brought us to a difficult place. But God is still in control. And God sees and God knows and God cares. And his work, the good news of Easter, that resurrection is possible, that new life is possible, that spiritual deliverance and forgiveness of sins is, is possible, that's an unstoppable message. And just like the cross and Calvary and the grave and Satan couldn't stop that good news 2,000 years ago, there's nothing in this world, not height or depth or length or breadth, not a virus, not a, an army, uh, not a bomb, not a, a sickness that could possibly stop the good work that God wants to do and has done through Jesus' work on the cross. That nothing can stop you from trusting Christ as Savior, if that's what you choose to do. That nothing can stop you from faithfully living for Him. And that nothing can stop you from enjoying eternal life with the Lord if you choose Him as your Savior. See, people can harm us like they did Jesus. They can falsely accuse us and lie about us like they did Jesus. They can even kill us like they did Jesus, but that won't stop the good news of Easter because God is the one who has power over the grave and gives eternal life. That's the unstoppable good news of Easter. Not only is that good news inspired, not only is it unstoppable, but it's also good news that is irrefutable. Paul continues in verse 31 and says that Jesus was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are witnesses unto the people. Paul wants the people that hear his message to know that he didn't just invent this story, that there were many eyewitnesses to the crucified and resurrected Christ. In fact, the Bible tells us that at one time, Jesus appeared to more than 500 witnesses, nothing that could be explained by hallucination or anything else. 
Uh, and the gospel writers, in fact, listed the names of many of the people who had seen and interacted with the resurrected Christ so that the first century readers of these accounts could corroborate the testimony by talking to those eyewitnesses themselves. Uh, the testimony of the eyewitnesses helps the resurrected Christ, the good news of Easter story, to be irrefutable. But not only were there eyewitnesses, but Paul is also going to point to fulfilled prophecy. Verse 32, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, that's the prophecy, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. He says the promises made to their ancestors, those prophecies that had been put in writing in the Old Testament scriptures, have now been filled in Paul's generation as Jesus died and rose from the dead. So fulfilled prophecy is a powerful demonstration that the good news of Easter is irrefutable. You know, when you hear about fulfilled prophecy, uh, maybe some things from pop culture come to mind, and it comes up in movies and novels, fulfilled prophecies, and there's kind of a sense of mythology there, or legend, or folklore, or fantasy. And that's too bad, because the scriptural prophecies are well documented, to have been written before the events transpired. And if you look at the detail by which Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection fulfill the ancient prophecies, it's an irrefutable story of good news. Paul's going to point to a couple of those fulfilled prophecies. He says in the second half of verse 33, As it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day I have I begotten thee, that the Messiah would be a son of David and a son of God, and as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. He brings up King David again because back in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 16, God had promised King David through the prophet Nathan that his heir, that an heir of the line of David would rule on the throne forever. Well, as time went by, it became very hard to imagine how that prophecy could possibly be fulfilled because the line of David was broken. And again and again, wicked kings would ascend to that throne until finally the monarchy was set aside by God. And it became almost inconceivable that one could reign forever on the throne of David as the lineage of David until Jesus Christ, the Messiah, came, a direct descendant from David's line in his human ancestry, and now is exalted with God on high and will reign throughout eternity in fulfillment of that Old Testament prophecy. Paul's going to point to another prophecy in verse 35. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That's a quote of Psalm 16, verse 10, a prophecy that the Holy One, the Messiah, would not be allowed to suffer corruption or to experience physical decay. In other words, the promise was that though this Messiah would die, his body would not decompose in a grave. Again, it's hard to imagine how that could be fulfilled by any human uh, ruler or deliverer except Jesus Christ, who though he died and was placed in a tomb, was there for a short enough time that his body did not decay, a direct fulfillment of Psalm chapter 16. Uh, for David, after he had served his own generation, verse 36, by the will of God, fell on sleep, or he died, and was laid unto his fathers, that is, he was buried, and saw corruption. In other words, he decayed. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Yes, David lived and died and was buried, and his bones uh, turned to dust, just as man came from dust, but not Jesus. His body did not suffer decay because of the fulfillment of prophecy. There are dozens of others of prophecies made about the Messiah, specifically his death and resurrection. Uh, for example, that he would be betrayed by a friend, that he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver, that he would be forsaken by his disciples, that he would be accused by false witnesses, that he would remain silent in the face of these accusations, that he would be mocked and beaten, that he would be pierced through his hands and feet. Uh, that prophecy was made centuries before crucifixion was even uh, invented as a method of execution. Executed with thieves, 
that he would pray for those who killed him, that he would have no bones broken, that he would have his garments gambled for, that he would be buried with the rich, and many other uh, prophecies in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in detail hundreds of years later in Jesus Christ to show us that, yes, the good news of Easter, it's irrefutable. I realize that is a strong word, but if you will take an objective look at the accounts of those eyewitnesses, most of whom died defending the truth of what they said, and the fulfilled prophecies, it's hard to imagine any explanation other than that the good news of Easter is irrefutably true. Well, it's an inspired message. It's an unstoppable message. It's an irrefutable message. But the good news of Easter is also invitational. And that means that it's not just history. It is spiritual truth that God has designed to impact you and to impact me. There is an invitation attached to this message for all who would believe. Verse 38 Paul says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, that is Jesus, through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. That's the invitational aspect of the good news of Easter. Through Jesus Christ is preached to you, Paul said to his listeners, and it's recorded for us today, that invitation is extended to you today, that through this message you have the opportunity of forgiveness of sins. It's right there in verse 38, that when Jesus died on the cross, he did so not to set an example for us, not because he was overpowered against his will. He died on the cross so that a perfect sacrifice could bear the sins of the world, transferring his righteousness to all who would believe. That might be hard to understand, but it's spelled out for us in detail in Scripture so that we can see the atoning work of Christ was a sacrifice that only he could make as the only perfect man and yet the divine Son of God that he could make on our behalf so that whoever believes in him, John 3, 16, should not perish but have eternal life. It's a message of forgiveness of sins. You may be aware, acutely aware, of some needs in your life right now. That you're up against some things, that you're facing financial needs, you're facing emotional needs, you're facing needs in your relationships, in your, in your family, in your home, in your, in your work situation. And all of those can be pressing. But what you need to understand and realize today is that for each of us, our greatest need is forgiveness. That the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that the payment for that sin is death. And we're told in the book of Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. It blows my mind as I've talked with many people that will say they just haven't really thought much about what happens after death whether there is a next life, an afterlife, whether we have an eternal soul, that they just haven't thought about it very much. Well, we have to think about it. It's so important because this earthly life is but a drop in the bucket in comparison to the years of eternity that you will live somewhere after you stand before God following your appointment with death, just as I will stand before God following my appointment with death, no matter what that, when that might be. It might not sound like very good news, but the good news is there in verse 38, that this is a message of forgiveness of sins. That darkness you're experiencing, that emptiness you're experiencing, that lack of peace, that lack of hope and fulfillment is because of the burden of sin that we can't pay for, but Jesus paid on our behalf and is willing to forgive if we will but trust in him. It's an invitational message, and there are five ways that the people in Acts 13 responded to that message, really five ways you could respond today if God is working in your heart. The first one is is, uh, here in verse 39, that you could believe it. Verse 39 says, By him all that believe are justified from all things. That God can wipe your slate clean, no matter what your past, 
that you can never say, well, I, I've done too much. God couldn't forgive me. No, Paul says that those that believe are justified from all things. Neither can anyone say, well, I'm a pretty good person. I've done more good than bad, and I don't think I need to be justified. No, the Bible teaches that just one sin disqualifies us from God's standard of glory and enjoying eternity with him. And so we need to be justified of all things. And verse 39 says, that is the experience of those who believe, to be justified of all things. Well, that might seem too easy or too hard, depending on the perspective you look at it from. And so people will respond in a few other ways. Some will try to earn it. They'll try to earn it. Verse 39 says, you can be justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. See, a lot of people tried to be justified by the law of Moses. They thought if they could just keep the Ten Commandments and the hundreds of other laws attached to it about personal behavior and about moral ethics, that they could earn their way to righteousness. Well, Paul assures his listeners, and the writer of Acts assures us as readers today, that you can't be justified by fulfilling the law. No, you can't earn heaven. That's what he means in verse 39 when he says, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. No matter how good a life you lived, it's going to fall short of the perfect standard that God sets for his glory. Only Jesus could meet that standard. No one else could, and that's why his sacrifice alone is our hope for that forgiveness of sin. So you can't earn it, but some will try to earn it. Others will doubt it. Others will doubt it. Verse 40, Beware therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. What he's saying is that not only did God prophesy what would become of the Messiah, his death and resurrection, God also prophesied that there would be people that wouldn't receive this message. There would be people that would hear it and even understand it, but choose to doubt it. Despisers, he calls them, or scoffers is a word we could use, or skeptics, people who object and look at the evidence and look at the message and think of other explanations and explain it away and rationalize and choose to reject it. And Paul says, be careful because God prophesied that some people would hear this message and wouldn't believe it even though someone told it to them. They shall in no wise believe though a man declare it unto you. Then think about it, that such... A powerful attestation of the life and death and resurrection of Christ is provided and preserved for us. Yet so many out there want something more. They want a message in the sky. They want a personal uh, vision. They want God to appear to them and verify everything for them. All of those things could be doubted. All of those things could be written off as hallucinations or imaginations. But God has given us a more sure word. He has given us a written and inspired word so that we can go back to it again and again and see exactly what he did through Christ and what he wants to do in you. So don't try to earn it. Don't doubt it and object to it. But also don't postpone it. That's another reaction that some people had. They would postpone it. Verse 42, when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached unto them the next Sabbath. They said to Paul and Barnabas, hey, can you come back in a week and tell us more about this? And that was a good desire that they had. But sometimes we'll have a temptation when God is speaking to us through Scripture to try to postpone our response and say, well, maybe next week, maybe tomorrow, maybe next Easter I'll be ready to make this decision. No, don't postpone it. Uh, finally, there's the correct response in verse 43. The Bible says that when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So the positive response in verse 39, they that believe are justified, and verse 43, and continue in the grace of God. The way to respond to the good news of Easter is to believe in Jesus Christ, 
to believe that he did die on the cross, to believe that he did bear your sins, to believe that he did rise from the grave, and to believe that he does offer the forgiveness that Paul promises uh, from God for all who will believe. And if you do that, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to ha have a standard to live up to. You can continue in the grace of God. The Bible tells us that by grace we are saved. That not of ourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's according to his mercy that he saves. And so if you will believe that Jesus died on the cross, and today uh, have a response that will have an eternal impact. You know, they're telling us that this experience of quarantine that's unparalleled in recent history will be something that we'll tell our kids and grandkids about someday. That we remember living through those days when we were under stay-at-home orders for weeks and the economy was bad and the world was upside down with this virus. So most of those things that we might tell our grandkids about someday are pretty negative. But couldn't it be that God has a greater purpose for you personally through this experience, something far more meaningful that you could tell your grandkids about someday? That maybe you could look back and say, I was under quarantine and I clicked a link to watch an online service when I probably wouldn't have walked through the church doors if I hadn't been under stay-at-home orders. And so I heard an Easter message that I probably would not otherwise have heard. And God worked in my heart and God convicted me of sin and God drew me to himself and forgave me. And I was saved on Easter in 2020 during the coronavirus quarantine. Wouldn't that be something far more impactful that God could use in your testimony and he wants to do in your life right now? The fact that you're watching this uh, means that you're willing to receive a word of scripture. And I hope that you will respond with a soft heart toward God. In Psalm 96, the Bible says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Don't deny this message. Don't doubt this message. Don't try to earn salvation. Don't postpone your decision. Instead, believe that Jesus Christ died to take your place, that God offers forgiveness, and determine today that you will continue in his grace. You may have objections still, and maybe I haven't said anything particularly persuasive to draw you into salvation today, but I want to encourage you that if the Holy Spirit is working in your heart, that is, if you feel a tugging at your heart, a still small voice telling you that this is a message that you need, that this is something you need to respond to, I would encourage you not to do any of those other responses of doubting or objecting or rejecting or postponing, or earning, but instead to believe today and to receive God's grace. We're here to help you with that, and our contact information will be on the screen so that you can reach out to us to let us know that you've made that decision, or if you need some help or have more questions, we're here for that. We want to be of spiritual blessing to you if we can help you in making this decision. What's keeping you from that decision if you've never trusted Christ as Savior? I want to promise you that it's a decision you'd never regret. You're not going to run into Christians who say, well, I wish I'd never gotten saved. I wish I never had my sins forgiven. I wish God had never given me eternal life. Now, there might be negative people out there who profess to be followers of Christ. I don't know. But here at Thompson Road Baptist Church, when our doors are open, you'll find a group of people who are sinners but have had our lives transformed because we believe Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for that sin, and we personally have placed our trust in him to forgive us of those sins so that we would live not trying to earn it, not trying to have a great life, but trying to live for the one who died for us. And we live with the hope of resurrection because of the good news of Easter, that God is victorious over sin and death and hell, and we don't fear the grave because God is more powerful. You'll find here people who uh, would rejoice to see you make that decision. People who can't imagine going back to a life without Christ and people who have a heart to see others accept that truth as well. Will you accept that today? Will you trust Christ as Savior today and make this the year that you receive and are impacted eternally by 
the good news of Easter.